Hello and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host Brian. We're going to continue on with this week's theme of Dude, you gotta check this out. We're going to be looking at a band called Gri. The track we're looking at is Le Forge. And the song is 15 minutes long. Something tells me this is doom metal is kind of what I'm thinking. I know we've listened to Gri before and I can't remember what kind of music it is. So I guess the best course of action is to simply dive in and find out what they're bringing to the table. Not what I was expecting at all. This is gorgeous. Really nice bass idea right here. There's something really interesting going on with the rhythm in the last section. I ain't quite figured out though. It was either a very interesting pattern over 4-4, four, four, or we were working on like a 15-16 against two bars of 4-4. Four, four. So it was just shy of the full 16 beats we would expect of a typical 4-bar phrase. Some really nice atmospheric stuff coming in from non-metal instruments. A lot of that's removed now, of course, I just brought it up. Yeah, more of the weird rhythmic stuff, but this time I'm fairly certain this is all 4-4. Just very playful uh, rhythmic patterns. Some harmony for the guitar. A 
interesting. Almost introducing a slight hint of a swung idea right there in the drums, based on the syncopation of the bass kick against the cymbal. Between the vocal delivery and the heavy focus on atmosphere, this is black metal, isn't it? Maybe post-black metal? Definitely in that family of, of metal, though. That real strong resonance the vibrations of that string trying to break free a little bit of a flute cello in here too I got a violin maybe that wasn't a flute maybe that was a violin earlier So we're in a 10 working on, oh no, it's 11, isn't it? 3, 3, 3, 2. Yeah. But what's really interesting is the fourth time through this, we go to a full 12. Oh, and the delay. Yeah, instead of 3332, three, three, we get a 3333. Three, three, three. So we pulled to a full 12-8. Very cool. Bass is holding everything down while the song feels like it wants to implode or possibly explode. So we still have the triplet feeling in the symbols, but we're really only emphasizing beat one of it, making it feel like we're in a slower four, which fits well with, with a 12 8 time signature, which can give us three and four subsequently, and allows that polymeter to exist within a tight loop.
Okay, so back to 4-4 here, but working with a 3-3-2 grouping. Really fun rhythmic idea coming from the drums. That snare accent pattern is bonkers. A little bit of a release there at the end of that. Yeah. A little bit of his vocal delivery coming out against the compression at the end of some of these uh, held notes. The bass kick production just being a low thuddy rumble. So we've shifted to seven here. That big slide on the base. Find a little bit of groove to wrap this up. Really interesting placement of the percussion. I wonder what that's supposed to represent. Yeah, dude, the ending wants to fall apart.
they weren't content with just writing a 15 minute epic. It needed to go into the next track. Well, at least the next track is only a minute 50, but something tells me that goes into the next one, which is 11 and a half. And now you're close to making a half hour <laughs> song. And that's not even bringing the idea that the rest of the album might all be interconnected too. Uh, yeah, so that's wild. Definitely see why this was something I had to listen to. Especially since it is within the realm of black metal, something I typically don't like. This is one of those choices that I'm always happy to get to. Black metal exists outside of that traditional, I think it's third wave sound, uh, 16th notes all the time, blast beats from the drums, harsh vocals, and mid to lo-fi production. That kind of stuff is ever present, and it's not something that's just relegated to black metal. There is cookie cutter death metal, there's cookie cutter metalcore, there's cookie cutter, that's hard to say, <laughs> I'm starting to twist my tongue up. Uh, you know, there's a lot of ways, uh, there's plenty of genres, I should say, that have bands that are completely working within the realms of imitation and mimicry, um, and just basically wearing their inspirations on their sleeve very clearly. And it creates, uh, sounds within a genre that can become stale for people, uh, even within fandom of, of said genre. Although that's not always true. Like, you know, like I've said before, I'm a huge fan of post-hardcore. There's been some songs we've checked out on the channel where I'm like, yes, this is 100% my jam. And somebody in the comments will be like, oh, this just sounds like 10 other bands. And like, yeah, it does. And that's very comfortable. And I'm enjoying that right now. Um, and so those black metal bands that make that stereotypical black metal style of music I, uh, I'm not throwing any shade at them. There's a fandom for that. There's definitely a purpose and a need for that. Um, it's just not my cup of tea. And so, for the most part, I kind of turn my back on black metal. I check it out when you guys want me to, but it's a genre I'm pretty... I'm pretty wary of. And weary of. I suppose I can go with both words on that. So when someone tells me you got a black metal song queued up for you, I'm like, ah, geez, another one. <laughs> but black metal has some really cool things that are adjacent to it, and even ones within the framework entirely. Early black metal was a bit more experimental. Second wave black metal was interesting. And then we also have the modern fourth wave stuff and post black metal, uh, seeing black, black metal production and atmosphere showing up in other genres. There's definitely some cool things to go on within the genre that just exist outside of that core sound that it has become associated with. That's where this comes in. And I'm glad I've listened to this. I, I'm, I'm still not going to say that, that I'm enthralled by this. I don't have to go out and listen to the whole album. I think I've had enough of a taste with just these 15 minutes, but I am surprised by it. and. Um, in a sense, enjoyed what I listened to. Uh, don't take that the wrong way. <laughs> uh, I didn't hate this, and there were some really cool things in it, but it's still... It's still black metal at the end of the day. Uh, and I suppose I'll get to what that means. I don't want to dismiss it because of its genre. That's a dumb way to talk about music, but there's some elements in it that still don't quite work for me and something that I would want to listen to all the time. But I do want to start with some of the cool stuff first before I get to most of that because I'm kind of a broken record on those concepts. It's a lot of it's production. We'll just say that right there. One thing I loved in here though is the drumming. I know that was probably the probably the instrument I brought up the most. Yeah, dude, the drums are just fantastic in here. Never really a dull moment as far as pattern is concerned. It really doesn't even matter what kind of music is the, the drummer's playing within, what the tempo or time signature is. The drummer is just never happy with sitting within the pocket and leaning into being that human metronome. 
the drummer always has some sort of clever rhythm or pattern or just what seems to my ear as a completely linear melodic idea coming out of the drums. There's always something there that transforms the section, which I think is really important. A lot of this song is atmospheric. There really aren't any strong melodies or hooks in here. We do have some cool, uh, more linear lines coming from violin. Uh, the bass takes lead a couple of times. There's a couple of licks or riffs coming from the lead guitar. But for the most part, all of that is kind of stuffed under the atmosphere, the feeling, the vibe of the track. That's what's most important. There are some melodic ideas that show up at times, but unlike other music where that is given the spotlight, this time it's stuffed down into the mix. So the majority of the song is hyper-focused on atmosphere above all else. If the drums had stuck to something a bit more traditional for their drumming, I don't think I would have engaged with the song as much as I did, simply because there isn't that much to latch on to aside from shutting down your brain and feeling the track. And as usual, there is plenty of room for music like that. I even enjoy music like that in a casual listening, envir listening environment. I find it more difficult to engage with it in this environment. Critically thinking, lights on, cameras on, people wanting me to analyze the music and tell you what it means, what it's doing, and all that kind of stuff. And so the drums are there to help the story, sorry, to help the song find direction. I don't even necessarily think it's always for momentum. The drums just always point towards something else. None of these sections regardless of how long they last, feel stagnant because the drums feel like they're constantly evolving. They're constantly changing up their ideas, shifting and morphing into other concepts that lead us into the, sub the next idea and the idea after that and the idea after that. And so while there are some sections in here that hunker down a little bit and say, this is the vibe we're going to be working on right here. This is the emotion we're going to be exploring. And buckle up. Uh, no, grab a seat. <laughs> buckle up would be like if we're moving somewhere. Uh, grab a seat and get comfy is kind of the idea I get. Um, and the drums are like, okay, that's cool and all, but you know, also I'm going to be over here laying down some real funky stuff. And so if you're not, if you're not fully bought into this environment, there's something cool going on over here too. Uh, and it'll help pass the time because we, we are moving towards somewhere. We just really want to explore this idea right here first. What I find even more fascinating about the drums though is that their patterns are very bizarre, their accent patterns, but even more so when they're within the odd time signatures. And there are some odd time signatures in here. Uh, there is, uh, the song exists in 4-4 for a vast majority of the track. The drum patterns confused me at the beginning of the song. I didn't know if we were in 4-4. I think we were. Now that I've heard a section that was similar to the intro and I had a chance to count it out, I think it is in 4-4, but the drum pattern is so obtuse that it feels like we're skipping beats or delaying sections. And I couldn't ever quite get a, a strong grasp of that intro section when we were there. So even in 4-4, the drums are doing weird stuff. But we also explore a 7-8. We explore groupings of 11-8 and 12-8. Uh, in, uh, what were we doing? We were doing 11-11-11-12. Uh, at one point in the song. And so you'd get really comfortable with this idea of 11, of, of lurching into the beginning of the next uh, section just a hair bit earlier than you would expect since 11 is odd. Uh, and then after three rotations of that, then you get a full bar of the 12. It feels like it's complete, but it also feels strange because you've begun to acclimate to this 11. You're used to the lurch, and then that lurch isn't there. 
and now that feels weird even though it shouldn't. Um, and then we eventually lean full on into this 12-8, yeah, 12-8, which allows us to have a 3 against 4 polyrhythm going on, sorry, polymeter going on that works really well and was a beautiful evolution from this 11 to the full 12 and then to this polymeter. Just a, a beautiful thing completely directed by the drums and bass. Very cool idea. Uh, and I loved every moment of that. But even within that 11, what I was going back to is, uh, and when we hit the 7 later on too, is that the drummer just emphasizes very odd choices. Towards the end of the track, we shifted to 4-4 um, four, four again. Um, but if we do two bars of 4, that gives us 8 beats. The the band was breaking this up into three three two, so we'd have one two three one two three one two one two three four five six seven eight, and you get this uh this quick del this quick burst of accents on seven and then one, whereas every other time we have two beats between the accents. It makes the end of the uh, phrase feel like we're rushing forward a little bit before getting back into our regular pace. The band was emphasizing one four and seven the drums were not it was like one three i don't know six and eight or something um and it was just it was bonkers it was bizarre it was right before the end of the track too so i i, I didn't know this at the time but this part started to feel like it was falling apart the band were no longer i mean the drums were always in their own world anyways but rhythmically they tended to have some harmony to their differing accent patterns. Here at the end, though, it was just causing the rhythmic element to crumble, the foundation, the, ryth the rhythmic pulse of the song, which has been the foundation of this whole track, was beginning to crumble. And then at the very end, I had mentioned that the song was trying to fall apart. There's just a lot of strange ideas in the ending, and I didn't even realize that this idea right here with the 332 was sort of alluding towards and foreshadowing where we were going. Very interesting. But yeah, drums, rhythm, time signature, all of it. This whole song's just full of really neat ideas uh, that can feel a bit off kilter the first time through, but absolutely work on a groove and rhythmic level. And so while you know, it usually took me a little bit of time to get into it. I'm sure on multiple listens, you can really get into the groove of some of these sections where they aren't uh, unusual anymore. You're a bit more familiar with what Gri is doing and uh, can groove along with them. And there are some groovy sections in here. It kind of surprised me. Black Metal has groovy bands. They have groovy subgenres. Uh, it's just not a genre I tend to think of for groove. It's very cool to hear it in here, especially we had the swung section. It was very, it wasn't like the, all the instruments were played with straight eighth notes, but the rhythm that was like a, what would you call it? Like a complex rhythm coming off of all of the instruments of the drum kit together was creating a swung idea, even if it was more of like, I don't know, a hocketed rhythm, if we could call it that, like the swing comes from pairing up all the different timbres of the drum kit. It was, it was bizarre. I was not expecting that at all. <laughs> oh man. Atmosphere. I think that's really the only other thing that I, I want to talk about here. A, a little bit of it is, is timbre, right? The guitar tones themselves and the guitar tones here are very fuzzy. I can make out notes sometimes. There's a couple of riffs, and this is what I was talking about earlier with guitar leads getting tucked into the music. The fuzz really dominates things. I can sort of hear past it at times. But I have to really focus. This is the guitar tone. That's the static. Remove that. Focus on the pitch. And it's not something that I think is completely hidden, like some of the lo-fi black metal we've listened to in the past. But it also isn't put in the spotlight at all. It is something I do have to focus on and kind of push everything else out of my uh, my attention. 
and then I can hear what the guitar is doing, but it is not something I just hear naturally. When I take the whole song in, all I really get is the fuzz of the guitars on the outside. And so that creates an atmosphere all on its own. It's a bit oppressive to me. What I basically it forces me to strain. You know, normally when it comes to guitar melody, I don't have to listen that hard to hear it. In many genres, it is the lead tone alongside the vocals. And even in a lot of metal, where the vocals get pushed into the mix, the guitars are loud and prominent. So, uh, you know, guitars like to show off their riffs. They like to show off their chops and their solos. You know, <laughs> A lot of metal guitars do not tuck their sound in. They put a lot of work into their skill and craft. They showcase it in the production. Uh, but this doesn't. And so... What does the band do then to ensure that they have this black metal, fuzzy production sound, but they do want to get some melody across to the listener. They want to get some uh, clean lines across this track. They allow the guitars to have their riffs, to tuck them under the production, and then they put string on top of that. And I think it's a very interesting decision. The string tends to cut through the noise in a way I wouldn't expect, but doesn't sound weird. And this is a topic I've brought up only a couple of times, but expectation of sound, right? If you hear vocal distortion, especially with lots of projection behind it, we kind of know that that's yelling or screaming. When we hear a voice begin to crack, we expect a lot of volume to be behind it. If that sound is then edited in post and the volume is brought down, it's going to sound strange to our ears. Unless there's like heavy reverb to it and then we can attribute distance to it. And we're like, okay, that sounds a bit more natural. The same thing happens with instruments. If you hear a very big, wide tuba tone but it's super tiny. That sounds a bit off to us. Guitars, lots of distortion, overdrive, which is basically pumping the volume up way over the limit so that you actually clip and distort some of the the audio coming through. We expect this to sound loud. By definition, overdrive means your volume is too high. If you have a really loud, heavily distorted guitar, that sounds off. We expect it to be loud. What happens here is we have ridiculously distorted guitars. We expect their volume to be loud. The volume is loud. That matches. And then we get string work on top of that. There is a part of me that expects that to sound odd. And yet it doesn't. I accept it at full face value. This cello is louder than an electric guitar. I don't know what trickery went into the production for that to happen but it it works. <laughs> Very surprising. Same thing with the violin. Even with the quieter violin lines, I was like, okay, this is a production decision and it works more so than uh, something feels a little off here. I find that fascinating. And as usual, when it comes to black metal, I'm curious about the production on it all. It almost feels like there's an entirely different world for black metal production, and I wonder just how many people can produce music in other genres and just naturally come over to black metal, listen to a track, and say, yeah, okay, and then mix it down like a normal black metal track would be. Because I don't think that number's very high. I think black metal is... It's its own dialect, and there's some things that I think a producer could just pick up on and other things that are tricks of the trade. you got to be taught from someone who knows what they're doing. It's, uh, it's, just, it's so baffling to me, all the decisions they do, because a lot of it is destructive. It's done in ways to, well, typically take the song in directions that are counter to what pretty much every other genre does as far as stacking, layering, balancing, placement, all of it. And yet it makes it sound complementary in a way that pushes the art forward. I suppose you could replace all that with it makes it sound good. Good's a bit more subjective, but I mean, people like this. 
So, uh, and I don't think it's bad either. And I'm typically the first one to complain about <laughs> lo-fi or in this case, mid-fi production. So, uh, yeah, it's just, it's really impressive to me and it kind of boggles my mind. I, I want to learn it out of sheer, what's that, curiosity. Where we, oh, we were talking about atmosphere. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So all of this compression uh, and distortion of the instruments, even the drum kit has a lot of compression to it. I mentioned there at the end when we finally got the constant bass, bass kicks, it was more like a, a dull thudding. There was really no impact, no big hit at the beginning. Every note just kind of blurred into the other so we don't have the impact of the attack. That's kind of been removed. It is... Sort of like a little knocking on a, on a hollow, I don't know, this metaphor is, I'm losing it. <laughs> Everything's compressed and distorted. Let me get these clean strings though. And they always give us these beautiful quasi melodies. They don't really move fast enough for me to say that they are melodies, but they are more melodic than harmonic. Harmonic being strictly focusing on chords and chord progressions. And they work really well against what the guitars bring to the table. What the bass brings to the table. Uh, and the bass too, man. I love that bass stuff. There are some, some moving fluid ideas in there, but the bass also does a fantastic job of sort of being a foundation plus. The bass presents us the sound floor, the bass presents a lot of chordal movement, but there's a little bit more melodic element to how the bass moves between their notes, and so it kind of blurs the line. It is foundational, I think, primarily, but it does do melodic ideas as a secondary attribute to its lines. It's just, it's really strong bass writing, and it punches through the mix in a way that it really shouldn't. <laughs> Everything is so compressed and dirty and gritty and then the bass has this nice clean warm tone that works well alongside the cello and violin. I think the bass would feel out of place by itself but with the additional strings that pop up from time to time the bass feels like it walks the line between both worlds the metal and the uh, orchestral. There's just a lot of cool things going on in this track. And it all works, even though I think it shouldn't. And I think it all comes down to a tasteful balance between ideas. And I'm sure there's a lot of ways that that balance is achieved and sought after that I didn't pick up on this first time listen. One of those ways is quite possibly musical storytelling. I don't really know what emotion I felt listening to this. I was so caught up with a lot of the technical elements that I never really emotionally engaged with it. I do know that it is usually on the slower side. It's a heavier sound production-wise, and it's definitely not a bright and happy sound harmonically, though I don't know if I'd call it completely negative either. Maybe a sort of neutral, neutral minus feeling. But again, before I really commit to an idea on that, I would have to listen to it again and focus primarily on the emotional components of the atmosphere. I'm going to look into the lyrics right here, and then we'll wrap this video up. And y'all are going to have to help me with these lyrics, because it might be due to the translation. They're going right over my head. The original lyrics are in French. It talks about a group of people who come from before. Kind of speaking about that in general, there is one stanza that says, We come from before the world's collapsed. But there's also lines that say, We're coming back from wars. Earlier, it says we're coming back from clouded continents. Also says that we're the dawn of a murderous night. We'll come full of nebulae and sunshine. I don't know. There's a lot of dark illusion in here. The sunshine feels very out of place. I wonder if that's a translation thing. It's just supposed to be sun 
or sun rays going along with the space idea of nebulae. Uh, but sunshine means a very different thing entirely. It tends to be more of an optimistic uh, use of the word. But it's it has ideas of black dreams and shadow pearls, deserts of flames that they have... Uh, uh, ships bringing back secret treasures of sorrow, melancholic steel, and harmful curses. There's a lot of negativity in here, and this group is bringing it behind them, continuously calling themselves the dawn of a murderous night, born beyond sadness. At one point says that they're forever alive. They are the rhythms of the future and the fruit of all darkness. But beyond this vague idea of them being this negative force intruding upon the next thing, although it keeps saying they're coming back, so that's also something that confuses me, because it almost feels like they're on um on a war path. But it feels like they left and are returning. So, I don't know. Maybe where they're returning to isn't something that they're... Where sorrow is negative. Right? I don't know. I don't know. Let me know your thoughts on uh, this track from Gri. I, I don't know what's going on with the lyrics. If you have any thoughts on it, though, please let me know. Also, if there's anything about the song you want to add on to what I said or correct me on, maybe just give me your own thoughts, perspectives, and opinions on. Toss all that stuff down in the comments as well. Above that, in the description box, you'll find a link to Linktree. It takes you here. You can find links to my music, ways to support the channel, a link to the Discord server, and so much more. Above that, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I greatly appreciate all three of those. That wraps it up for this one, but we do have another track for this week's theme to explore next. Otherwise, I'll be back tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 9 p.m. UTC. As usual, we're going to explore two more songs for this week's theme of Dude, You Gotta Listen to This. Until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to, and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening whenever you choose to watch my videos. Thank you.